I'd like to welcome everyone, thank you, for, to, to our webinar that's going to be focusing on overview of fraud in the motion picture and television industry. Uh, it is, again, an honor having um, this presentation put together with my colleague, Tracy Liang, as well as my good friend, Chad Fitzgerald. And I'll briefly introduce each of, each of us in our backgrounds. Uh, and with that, very quickly, um, from a logistical perspective, uh, this is a live presentation. And so as you uh, think of any questions, please, please uh, feel free to put your question in the Q&A uh, function here uh, on Zoom. And in each one of our sections, toward the end of that section, we will be definitely looking at those questions and looking to answer as many of them as we can within the time that we have. We have a full hour. And with that, Tracy, why don't you uh, go on to the next slide? Um, my, my name again is Ilan Haimov. I'm a partner at GHJ, uh, where I lead the profit participation services practice at the firm. And uh, I will be discussing uh, some of the basics of fraud. Let's go on to the next one. And then, as I mentioned, uh, Chad Fitzgerald is a partner at Kinsella, where he focuses on entertainment litigation matters and has many years of experience and quite a bit of, of recognition. Uh, all of you should have access to these uh, bios and feel free to look at them. On to the next slide. And again, as I mentioned before, Tracy Liang is a senior manager uh, here at GHJ, where she works with me in the profit participation area. Uh, and Tracy will talk about examples uh, of, of various uh, fraud uh, instances that we've uh, researched and we'll be sharing that with you. And going back to Chad, Chad will be talking about litigation aspect of fraud and uh, the way we'll structure it, I'll, I'll go through the basics. Tracy will then lead with those examples and then Chad will close with, again, the, um, the aspect of fraud and specifically as it relates to litigation matters. So with that, um, on to the next slide, Tracy. Okay, so basics of fraud. What we wanted to do is we wanted to start with some basic information, um, which we feel is critical uh, to talk about fraud from a business standpoint, not so much from a legal perspective. A lot of that is coming from my background uh, when I used to be the chief audit executive for a couple of large organizations uh, where I was responsible for anti-fraud um, uh, activities within within those organizations. Both companies were publicly traded and were subject to all kinds of different regulations which required us to have uh, these fraud controls. So with that, on to the next slide. So from a uh, for basic, basic terms, you know, definition of fraud, uh, which uh, is provided by the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners is, the use of one's occupation for personal enrichment through the deliberate misuse or misapplication of the employing organization's resources or assets. And in other words, fraud is cheating and could involve money, property, or both. So it's fairly elementary and basic, uh, but it is coming from, again, a business perspective uh, to begin the conversation here for this afternoon. So on to the next slide. And um, keeping in mind that it is astounding numbers here. Fraud costs United States businesses probably now over $1 trillion a year. It is a massive amount. Um, and, and really, if you use the percentage term, it's about 7% of the annual revenues are simply lost due to fraud across the whole industry, across the whole, the whole economy, excuse me. And uh, what we have to keep in mind is uh, the, the cost of fraud goes far beyond financial cost uh, because you may have brand, brand reputation issues, business relation issues with your vendors and customers, as well as potentially uh, staff issues. You know, staff may be leaving, and the cost is is enormous when they do that. Next slide. When you think about your organization. It could be a small firm, it could be a large firm, um, it could be your clients, uh, it could be your vendors, it could be anybody you know that has an organization, small or big. When you think of fraud risks within your organization, uh, it's important uh, at least annually to uh, 
identify those key risks, um, prioritize, um, and you know, based on your budget and and again the risk level, and establish controls to make sure you minimize uh, those risks. And then finally, monitoring and looking for any significant changes. Some of the basic uh, elements of fraud and controls really are around technology. So for example, if you got all of your records on the cloud, do you have, again, controls to ensure that there is proper access, um, minimizing access to those who are not supposed to be getting into that data uh, and monitoring to make sure the controls are in place? Just using that as a simple example. Next slide. The three general types of fraud, according to the ACFE, again, the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, are asset misappropriation. It's essentially taking assets that don't belong to you, theft or misuse of assets. This is the most frequent type of fraud. It happens often, more often than we even know. Uh, the second type is corruption, when an individual wrongfully uses his influence to benefit themselves. So for example, taking the company jet and using it for personal use is an example. And finally, fraudulent statements. Uh, that's falsifying company financial statements. Again, um, that is by far the most severe and most significant type of fraud. And you can see that in the chart on the right. This is based on actual reported fraud instances um, you know, through the annual uh, study that the ACFE puts together. Again, asset misappropriation being the most frequent and then fraudulent statements being most significant. Next slide, please. What we wanna keep in mind based on thousands of actual fraud instances of the ACFE research over the years, in general, fraud occurs when three major factors come in play altogether. Uh, number one, does the fraudster have the opportunity uh, to commit the fraud, whether they have access to records, access to cash, access to systems? So the opportunity is, is, is the first factor to keep in mind. Uh, the other one is incentive and pressure. Uh, say you are a CFO of a company and you're under a lot of pressure to meet financial goals, um, and that pressure could play, or could play a, a key factor in, make, you know, in, in making you commit the fraud. But the final factor that is critical here is attitude or rationalization. So if from an ethical perspective, you rationalize committing the fraud, and I'll, I'll give an extreme example in a second, but with attitude or rationalization along with incentive or pressure and the opportunity, the fraud will occur. A rationalization would be you have um, a family member, unfortunately getting, um, uh, kidnapped in the middle of um, the ocean. And uh, you need to find money to save your family member as soon as possible. And you have the opportunity to get access to cash. I may be rationalizing taking the money um, because I want to make sure my family member is saved, regardless of what the consequences may be. So I think that using this as a simple example, that you may have these three factors coming together to commit the fraud. Next, please. So how fraud is uh, typically found, it's, it's unbelievable, but um, in general, it's either, in most cases, uh, either a tip by an employee or a vendor or a third party or by accident. Those are the two main ways uh, a fraud is uncovered. Uh, you may have other, other methods such as external audits, internal audits, surveillance tools, and various different data mining tools. But What's unbelievable about all of this is it's actually going to be either a tip or by accident. It's just unbelievable. That's typically how it's found. Next, please. Uh, when you think of who and what is the most typical type of fraud within uh, the entertainment space, uh, the median loss, uh, again, according to the ACFE, is approximately $90,000 per incident. Unfortunately, uh, again, me and uh, Tracy representing an accounting firm, it's, it's uh, unfortunate for me to say that it's actually the accounting function is the one of the highest, uh, most likely to commit fraud in 14% in of, the, of the instances. And then the most, the most common type of fraud is cash, stealing cash, corruption, or skimming. So essentially stealing money before it's being reported by the company. Next slide, please. <clears throat> 
Um, one thing to keep in mind in these days, cyber fraud is, is, is really the one to keep an eye out for. And these are real examples of instances where studios and networks uh, have been uh, victims of fraud. And I think the most, the most notable one, although it's old, is still certainly most memorable. And that has to do with what happened to Sony in 2014 and the significant uh, impact it had on the operations of the studio. Um, certainly, there are many, many other examples, but that's one that I think that comes to mind right away. And it's unfortunately becoming more and more frequent today with technology becoming stronger and uh, probably more available for fraudsters than ever before. Next slide. So what do we do? Uh, believe it or not, just before this meeting, uh, before this webinar, I got an email that says, um, did, did I make sure, it's really a confirmation email that uh, wanted to confirm that I received the $3.5 million that I was supposed to get a month ago. <laughs> Certainly I did not click on any links that came along with that email, but again, remember, avoid clicking on suspicious links. That's what we hear from our IT department all the time. And uh, we as a firm actually have a periodic penetration testing by a third party to make sure that our systems are operating properly to minimize the risk of cyber fraud. Next slide, please. Um, one thing I wanted to mention is we have to remember that many of our employees uh, and many of our partners and those who do business with are working from home because of COVID. And there's actually higher risk uh, that's associated with working from home. Uh, and it's important. And again, this comes out of a PwC Global Economics Crime and Fraud Survey a couple of years ago. But it's important for us to ensure that there are system controls for people um, to, you know, be able to work from home safely, uh, making sure that we educate our employees and, and various third parties we work with that they uh, are aware of the risks uh, that are associated with using their own Wi-Fi from home and other technology when working uh, on the cloud or working in their systems um, that they have access to. And finally, uh, they're probably going to need to be increased monitoring of systems because of that, because, because our uh, workforce is more dis dispersed around the country and around the world in many cases. Next slide. And then finally, just going back to my own experience, uh, what we've always done in creating an anti-fraud program, whether it's a small company or big, is we want to make sure that we, we look at it from a cultural perspective. Obviously, tone at the top is going to be critical. Um, policies and procedures need to be in place like code of conduct and other policies, particularly around technology, training our employees and our partners and our third parties that we do business with. And finally, having, as I mentioned earlier, some, some level of compliance monitoring. And the simplest one would be a uh, perhaps an annual uh, penetration system that you can, you can look to, to a third party technology company to partner with you. And I believe, let's see, I believe that may be the final slide for me, but just let's double check. Yep. So with that, uh, before I go on to the next section where we're going to go deeper into specific examples of fraud in the motion picture and television industry, Chad, are there any questions? Um, yeah. Josh, Joshua Lastine asked if we're going to discuss fraud in raising capital for film financing, specifically how... Uh, it relates to crypto being an unbacked security and somewhat uh, susceptible to fraud. Do you have any thoughts on crypto in general or film financing in particular? We actually, um, we, we have one or two examples that are specifically related to that. So uh, we, we may want to hold off because uh, Tracy will be discussing one or two instances relating to fraud with film financing and in one one case that I, uh, that I would bring up, uh, which, which is quite interesting, uh, a couple of slides ago, I, I talked about uh, cyber fraud examples. And in one case, Disney was subject to fraud. Um, thank you, Tracy, going back uh, in connection with um, Pirates of the Caribbean, where uh, there was a demand um, for, an over, for an enormous amount of Bitcoin money to be paid as a ransom. Uh, to prevent from a Pirates of the Caribbean um, clips from being made available before it was released in the theater. So I think that it is an important area, uh, but what's really interesting, it's the fraudsters are using that uh, technology to their benefit, you know, demanding that, uh, that 
it's no longer cash in a in a suitcase, but it's actually a cryptocurrency that's being uh, transferred over to them. And it's unfortunately it's easier than ever um, for them to have access to that kind of technology and use that to their benefit. But let's I do want to I do want us to hold off on the on the financing question because there's one or two examples where Tracy will I think dive into into one or two examples I believe. Uh, just a couple more quick questions for you, Alon. Uh, Stephen Gamber asked, what specifically is penetration testing? Yeah, so the, what it is, is um, you would hire a technology company to effectively test your system controls once a year by attempting to penetrate into your system. So for example, if you have a system that is um, a house within your office, so you have a the hardware and the technology itself is actually in your office. They'll work with that technology, or if your information is on the cloud, they'll work with that technology. But effectively, what they'll do is try and attempt to get into the system uh, in, in various different ways to identify weaknesses in the system. And as a result, there's a report that gets issued with weaknesses, and then you work with that technology company actually on solutions to minimize um, from you know, from cyber fraud to actually occur by putting in patches or putting in controls. And again, you have to prioritize because you can't control everything, but you have to work with that technology company, not into just the penetration, but also the, you know, the hopefully the solutions as well. Um, thank you. The last question we have is, could you for a minute or two talk a little more about, uh, people find it interesting that accountants are responsible for most of the fraud. And someone asks, is it fair to assume that's because you're in a better position for to catch it, so there's more opportunity? Why do you think that is the case? Yeah, so- uh, Not you particularly, but you in general. No, 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 no. I, yeah, I completely understand the question. I think that a good example of that would be a production accountant that works on set. I'm, I'm using that as an example. Um, as a production accountant, I'll have access to writing checks, to paying, money electronically to probably having petty cash uh, with me. Um, and because I have access to all of that, the key question that, that I would always ask is, are there any, any segregation of duties with respect to these functions? So for example, is somebody other than that production accountant doing a periodic uh, bank statement reconciliation? Or are we trying to segregate um, one person holding on to the cash and another person is responsible for authorizing the payment. So I think that's really the reason it's, it's, it's the accountants having control over the cash or the um, instructions to wire money back and forth between the production, um, uh, whether it's the director or the producer and the studio that's or the, or the streaming service is actually funding this production. So I think that you've got to make sure that uh, you know, that there are more controls around that because again, uh, you'll have more frequency, unfortunately, of fraud in this area because that individual may have more control than than um, than appropriate, and they're the ones handling all the money. That's the reason. Okay, so with that, thank you, Chad, for running those questions by me, and thank you all for asking those questions. So I'm going to jump to you, Tracy, to take the lead from here. All right, thank you, Elon. Um, let me move to the slides. Um, all right, so I'm going to share five specific examples covering different types of fraud in the entertainment industry. And as we go through these examples, you will actually see how they connected to some of the topics that Elon already covered. For example, the fraud, um, the fraud triangle, and also um, some possible fraud prevention that we, we should keep in mind. So, uh, okay, let's move into our examples. So the first example is about a former Netflix executive accepting kickbacks from um, other outside vendors. So this person, Michael Kyle, um, was the former VP in charge of IT operations at Netflix. Um, so he accepted kickbacks from nine different tech companies. And in exchange, um, he approved millions of dollars in contracts for IT products and services. And in terms of the kickback arrangement, he actually set up a 
um, limited liability corporation. And this is just a company that had no employees or um, business location. So he just used that company to receive payment. Um, so after setting up that company, he signed a sales representative agreement with outside vendors. And um, the agreement, I think the terms is for those vendors to um, pay him money based on a percentage of the Netflix contract billings or a monthly quote unquote advisory fee. So he's he trying to frame it as some sort of consulting fee, but, but um, in essence, it's really a kickback that he received. Um, so ultimately he received over 500,000 in cash plus some stock options from those outside tech companies. And he used those kickback payments to pay for personal expenses and purchase of real estate. Um, okay, so the next slide we'll see. Um, so it was actually interesting how was this particular frosting discovered? So Netflix actually did not discover it until um, this person left the company. So based on core documents, Netflix ended up uh, finding about it by um, seeing references to our arrangement, or he says, getting my portion paid and referral fees in his emails with those third-party vendors. So that's how Netflix discovered it. So at the end, um, Netflix sued him for uh, the fraud, and he was sentenced to um, 30 months in federal prisons for his convictions for wire fraud, mail fraud, and money laundering. So now that we went through this example, I wanted to share a few fraud prevention methods. I think some of those mentioned by Elon already, but I just want to tie it to this particular case. So first, it's important to have um, separate procurement duties. So in this case, um, Kyle's responsibility include negotiating and executing contracts on behalf of Netflix. He also have the approval rights for in um, I mean, invoice payments to those third party vendors. So when I think just to reflect back, a more proper control should really involve multiple parties in the procurement process. So basically negotiation, execution and payment processing should be conducted by several individuals who can provide their independent opinions from different perspectives. Um, the second thing to keep in mind is that it's very important to conduct internal audits and control reviews. And especially for companies like Netflix that experience a really fast growth, uh, especially I think just given the circumstances, there's probably a huge increase in contract volume and IT related expenses. So in those situations, I think it definitely requires a robust system of internal controls, which may have helped the company to detect any variations and unusual activities early on. And the third uh, important thing to keep in mind is to have policies for vendor relations and also make sure there's company-wide for fraud um, awareness. So that could be educating employees on the, uh, the risk of accepting kickbacks and also having specific policies around vendor relations. Okay, so that's our first example, and I will move on to the next one, which is related to um, the um, Georgia Production Tax Credit Program. And as we know, Georgia probably has the most generous production tax incentive program in the country, which has transformed Georgia into a major production hub. And so production companies may be in uh, eligible to receive a tax credit up to 30% of the eligible e expenditures. And because billions of dollars have been granted by the state for the tax credits um, since they introduced the program in 2005, the state auditors perform an audit of the tax program itself to evaluate the effectiveness of the tax credit program. So they did the audit to evaluate the extent to which production companies that received the credit met the eligibility requirements. It also evaluated the extent to which um, companies were entitled to the amount that they were um, paid. 
So, um, so let's look at what the state auditor found. So they actually, so they, they did the audit, I think in 2020, and they released a long report that's like over 50 pages. So I just wanted to um, read some of the findings from the state auditors. So they wrote that due to control witness, companies have received credits for which they are not eligible and credits that are higher than earned. The, um, the auditors also found millions of dollars in ineligible expenditures, including payments to employees or contractors for work not performing Georgia and to vendors outside the state. Um, the auditor also wrote that Georgia requires company to provide less documentation than any of the 31 other states with a film, a film tax incentives. Um, and finally, I think this, I think they talk about deficiencies in the credit administrative controls and the significant financial benefits provided by the credit create an environment ideal for fraud. So I think these are very um, important things for us to keep in mind, especially thinking about the dollar value involved. I, I think it really um, means that these, these are important issues that the state should definitely address um, because there are currently maybe there's limited requirements and lack of clarity in the state law and there might be just limited resources. So the state itself cannot keep up with all of the uh, applicant, applicants for production tax credits. So, um, so that's the um, second example. And um, let me, let's go to the third example, which actually relates to one of the earlier questions um, that we have from the audience about raising capital and how that could be a fraud scheme. So let's talk about the next one. So this is about a froster who used fake documents and forged signatures to raise 14 million from foreign investment firms based in South Korea and China. So uh, the froster claimed that he had a movie project to be called um, Legends, and that project would depict um, American folklore icons. And as part of the scheme, um, the froster claimed that um, he had a deal with Netflix to distribute the picture and he supported his claim with bogus distribution agreement that contained forged signature from a um, Netflix executive. And he also forged emails purported to come from such executives using email addresses with like a Netflix domain. So he made everything seems like real um, by forging the documents. So the froster also told the investor that he, even though he had a deal with Netflix, but at some point that deal was terminated, but then he secured another deal with Amblin Partners, all of which uh, was false. So, um, so let's look at the outcome. At the end, um, the froster was sentenced to over eight years in prison for the investment scan. So let's think about this particular case. And I picked this case to share with everyone because I think it's very um, probably more common than we thought when it involves a foreign investor because for somebody that's not really familiar with the Hollywood industry, they're you know, in the foreign country, they can be very vulnerable to these type of fraud schemes. And, um, and when we think about it, Hollywood has been very successful at winning the world over with its created content. So when you are someone that, let's say you're a newly made Chinese billionaire, of course you wanted to put some money into a what appeared to be a renowned Hollywood production. And if you get lucky, maybe you can get some good financial return, or at least you will get um, invited to those parties and get to mingle with the stars. So I think that's probably the mindset from like a foreign uh, investors' perspective, but but really, um, when uh, investment investment opportunity like this come up, the investor should really um, take some steps to verify the the actual deal and whether that's a real deal or not. 
So if you're gonna give someone millions of dollars to produce a movie, you definitely want to verify um, this person's credibility, maybe do a Google search to figure out, okay, whether this person has done anything in the past to show that he's actually have a good track record of making movies. And, and of course, um, be very um, careful with those deals that purported to have big names attached. And, and the froster in this case, make it seem so easy to make a deal with Netflix and Emblem. And, and they even have big name producer and directors attached. And, and definitely for situation like this, you don't want to solely rely on this, what this person is telling you and whatever documents that he or she provides. But you definitely want to um, meet with um, others involved in the project and also consult with other uh, more experienced um, industry contacts to verify the viability of this project and the validity of the deals. So, um, so that's one example. And then let me move on to the next one, which is also related to uh, fraud in the film distribution deals. But this one, this particular example is at a much larger scale and impacted a lot more investors. So in, from 2014 to 2019, um, the Froster uh, set up a company which purported to be a film distribution company and um, he solicited investors with false claims that their money will be used to acquire distribution rights to certain films and then that they would try to make money by licensing those rights to platforms such as Netflix and HBO. Um, so in terms of the detail of the Frost scheme, the, um, I believe the Froster provided some purported film license agreements between his own company and um, sales agents and other um, um, distributors. So there's a group of private investors that wanted to enter into this type of deal. So they have um, either six months or 12 months promissory notes um, based on those forged statements. So the funds under those promissory notes were supposed to provide money um, for this company, one in million capital to acquire rights to specific films and then guarantee a specific return. Um, that's about 25% or 45% return on the investment. And unfortunately, I think in this case, um, the investor lost a lot of money and the Froster and his company remain in default to the investor and there's a total outstanding principle of over 230 million. And this has caused substantial financial hardship to dozens of investors. So the Froster at the end um, was sentenced to 20 years in federal prison for the Ponzi scheme. Um, and so in this case, I think I wanted to just share a few important things to keep in mind. And similar to what we discussed previously, I think it's always important to verify a person's credibility before putting money into investment. And, and be aware of promises of a high rates of returns and quick profits. And if something sounds too good to be true, and it most likely is. Um, so yeah, be aware of any unsolicited offers. And it's very important to take the time to talk to third parties, whether it's an attorney, your accountant, or any other reputable consultant who can provide an, like an independent view on the investment opportunity. So yeah, so I know these are things to keep in mind, but I, I believe all of these recommendations not only apply to fraud prevention in the entertainment industry, it also extends to many other industries as well. Okay, so I have, um, I think I have maybe one more example to share. Um, so, okay, so this is, um, this is a cybersecurity fraud example. 
So there are three men operating a 30 million scheme to steal copyrighted content from cable TV providers and retransmit it illegally. So the fraudster obtained content through um, their subscription to cable and video services from Comcast, Verizon, and several other um, service providers. They then set up cable boxes and devices to uh, strip the copyright protection and then restream the shows, movies, and other content on their own websites to thousands of their own paying subscribers. Um, so yeah, so a lot of um, um, high profile content was um, effective. So that includes show types Shameless, HBO's Game of Thrones, and the game show Who Wants to Be a Billionaire, uh, sorry, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, and many other ones. So, um, so at the end, the Froster were charged with criminal copyright infringement, wire fraud, money laundering, and um, several other crimes. And um, so I just want us to think about this. In this particular case, the Froster made over 30 million in illegal profits, but the actual value of those premium content is likely worth much more than um, those illegal profits. So this example really highlights the importance of investing in cybersecurity and copyright production. So, um, so yeah, so these are the examples I wanted to share today. They cover different types of fraud. And I wanted just to stop for a moment to see if anybody has any questions at this point. Yeah, unfortunately, um, and that, that we're saying that sadly, there are many other examples. We just did not have enough time within the hour, right, to, to present them. And we felt these are good examples uh, really to, to share with all of you that um, certainly it is occurring. Obviously, it's not pervasive, but, but there are instances where we come across the, these fraud instances. There are a couple of quick questions, one of which actually I'm going to ask Chad to see if maybe you even can guess the answer to the question. It has to do with the Michael Kale case, um, only receiving 30 months um, uh, while Horowitz got 20 years. I, I guess I guess it just depends which attorney, how good the attorney is. Maybe that's the answer, but I, I wanted to see if you have any sense of um, how could one can only, you know, would only get 30 months while the other one gets 20 years. So well, it's interesting. I saw that question. Um, and he hit on the the asker hit on the real um, distinction, right? Is that Michael Kale defrauded his employer while uh, the other person defrauded investors? And all I can attribute to is, you know, it's it's one thing to defraud your your employer. I don't want to say that's run of the mill or that happens all the time, but uh, investors who theoretically have a lot of financial backing behind them. Uh, can get very upset and bring a lot of uh, force to bear when they get defrauded. So I think that's the only way I can explain it, not being a criminal lawyer and not really being involved in either of those two cases. I mean, um, when you defraud you know, a big company like Netflix, no one's really sorry. And you know, that's sort of part of doing business or a cost of doing business. But when you defraud billionaire investors, they're going to bring the entire uh, you know, legal force to bear to protect their their investments. Thank you. That, that's, yeah. a great, that's a great answer. Tracy, I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, I think we just one, of course, I'm not a lawyer, but I just want to share from the financial impact perspective. I believe the, uh, the Netflix, Netflix case, the dollar value uh, is about 500,000. But for the other case that I share here, I think they defrauded, I think over, I think hundreds of millions. So it's not the same scale. So probably that also impact how the, the sentence was decided. Definitely. I, I think there's another question which, which is uh, goes in, in depth as to um, what is it that we can do to minimize these instances of fraud from occurring? And, and, and I would say that, gosh, if we could only find out about these issues early on, especially, and this is the, the focus is on um, representing investors who are, you know, attorneys on this on this webinar who may be representing investor in, in the case of Horowitz, what could they do differently? What could they do more 
to try and minimize that risk. And I think Tracy, you've mentioned this earlier where you may need to do more due diligence and perhaps do more background checks. And I don't know, Chad, if you were familiar with any of these services out there that could do at least some, some sense of verification of who you're really doing business with on the other side. Yeah, I mean, you can hire, there are very good private investigators that if you have the means to hire a private investigator, they can really find out who these person or people are um, and do some digging. And that would be a very wise investment. I mean, I go back to something that Tracy said, which I think is the the best advice that if you know especially in hollywood if something sounds too good to be true it probably is you know so if your alarm bells are going off that this you know this can't miss the investment opportunity just sounds too good it you know you should really really look into it and there are uh private investigators i'm sure Alon, your company works with some whose job it is to, to investigate this kind of thing sort of financial investigation um at the outset versus sort of forensically like like your company does um to really see if you know the money's there that they say it is if they are who they say they are that kind of thing in the interest of time there's a couple of other questions which i actually will will work to to respond uh chad during your segment uh but I, there is one specific question i just want to make sure i respond to and tracy and chad please chime in as well uh, and the question is well, to what extent if any has underreporting to profit participants by studios has risen to the level of fraud. I know that Chad, there's one in particular. That's what we'll talk about. Yeah. yeah, you'll talk about that. But I would I would say that um, in general, for me and our experience is that, that while we are not looking for fraud in connection with profit participation audits, um, for you know our focus is is really making sure our clients get their fair share. But there are instances that that we do come across that appear to be uh, red flags of potential fraud. And, but but I, I would say that in general, uh, the organizations that we are generally auditing, which are the larger and, and fairly sophisticated studios, um, those organizations have various controls that have been put in place over the years. But more importantly, I would say, since the Sarbanes-Oxley Act uh, was put in place uh, over 10 years ago, uh, to create anti-fraud programs and to create controls to minimize the risk of fraud. So I'd say that the smaller and less sophisticated the organization is that you're auditing, the higher the likelihood of red flags in connection with fraud will, will occur. Um, and so that, that, is, that is an interesting question, but I think it's not as, certainly it's not um, something that we see the, with the larger, more sophisticated organizations, obviously the, the, the smaller and the less frequent organizations that we do audit, there is that higher risk. So um, let's do this. Um, I will keep an eye on all these questions and see if I can answer those. But Chad, I want to make sure that we have enough time for your segment. So I will pass the baton to you. OK, thank you. Yeah, and I'll try to, we have about 15 minutes or so. So I'll try to go fast. Um, I'm going to speak to the litigation aspects of what Alon and Tracy have been talking about. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Tracy. Um, so I don't know how many litigators are in the audience, but uh, I, I find it very fascinating when Alon was talking about this sort of triangle of you know motive and opportunity that sort of generates or can generate fraud. But obviously, from a litigation perspective, you know we don't care about motive, right? Motive and intent are not elements to a cause of action for fraud. We care about sort of what happened and what we can prove that happened. So in the legal context, the California Civil Code actually defines fraud and or defines a number of different kinds of fraud. And interestingly, the Civil Code doesn't use the word fraud, they use the word deceit. And that's an interesting distinction. You know, we lawyers, that's what we do is deal with words, but that's really what fraud is if you're explaining to a, to a lay person or a, a non-lawyer client. It's, it's being lied to, it's being deceived, right? To your detriment, to your client's damage. So the, the four main types of fraud that are defined in the civil code are intentional misrepresentation, which is the classic fraud, right? That's what I would say nine out of 10 of the frauds that um, Tracy talked about are intentional misrepresentation. Someone lied to you. Someone told you something that wasn't true in order to induce your reliance on that lie. There's then negligent misrepresentation, which is the same thing, but it's negligence, not intent. It's they they may have honestly believed what they were saying was true, but they should have known, a reasonable person should have known that it was not true. 
Then there's concealment, just hiding bad facts, right? It's pretty obvious. And then the one that I'm gonna talk about the most today is false promise, which is also, I listed fraudulent inducement as a, as a sec, separate thing, but really that's a subset of false promise. That's the idea that you induced someone to enter into a contract based on a lie, based on a false promise to perform that you had no intent of actually performing. And we're gonna get into that. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? I'm not going to run through all these things. These are all taken from the uh, Casey jury instructions, but I just want to highlight these are the elements of intentional misrepresentation. And the first two are the most important. The defendant represented something as a fact to the plaintiff, and that representation was false. And defendant knew that it was false and it was made. Those are the primary things, right? And then there's re reasonable reliance, and lawyers spend a lot of time and money arguing about whether reliance was reasonable, but the main thing to take away from this is that there was a false representation and the defendant knew it was false and the defendant made it with the intent that the plaintiff would believe them. Um, go to the next one, please, Tracy. And again, negligent mis misrepresentation is a slight change to that. And look at number three, that's the important point, which is the defendant may honestly have believed that the representation was true but there was no reasonable grounds for believing it was true. A reasonable person should have at least questioned whether it was true or not. That's the negligence aspect. Uh, go to the next one, please. Concealment, again, it's uh, it's pretty straightforward despite all these words. It's just, it's hiding bad facts, right? You, you intentionally concealed a bad fact or you intentionally failed to disclose a bad fact. Um, the one A is interesting. Another way you can prove concealment is if the, if the defendant or and plaintiff are in a fiduciary relationship, if they're business partners, if they are lawyer and client, if they are you know agent and client, so any sort of fiduciary relationship, um, that can be a basis for concealment. Fiduciary duties impose a duty on you on people to be fully forthright with all the facts, good and bad. Um, go to the next one, please. So false promise. As a, as I'm an entertainment litigator, 90% of what I do is litigation in the entertainment industry. I work with Alon and Trace's firm all the time. I represent uh, talent mostly. So I'm usually on the plaintiff's side. I'm usually representing talent against studios. And false promise or the idea of false promise, which we'll get into, it comes up a lot. And that's a promise made with no intent to perform the promise when it was made. And we're gonna get into this at the end, but the question along that you raised actually prefigured something I wanna talk about. It's important to remember, and it's important to tell your, to advise your clients, not every contract that is breached was fraudulently induced. When, it, when there's a breach of contract, it doesn't necessarily mean there was also a fraud, and it doesn't also necessarily mean the breaching party had no intent to perform the contract when it was made. People enter into contracts all the time. People breach contracts all the time. 90 out of a, 99 out of 100 breaches of contract are the, the breaching party fully intended to perform when they made the contract, right? It's that one out of 100 where really there was never a present intent to perform their part and they said it only to get your client, the plaintiff, to agree and to sign off on the dotted line. That's a very important distinction. Um, if you can go to the next one, please, Tracy. And where we see false promise mostly, or where I see it mostly, is fraudulent inducement of contract. And that's where the defendant made a false statement to the plaintiff, knew at the time it wasn't true, basically, and in the contract scenario, knew at the time that they never had no intention to perform it, and they made the representation in order to persuade the plaintiff to agree. To the contract. And the plaintiff would not have entered the contract had they known the truth. And if all those things are true, then the, the, the fancy legal Latin phrase is the contract is void ab initio, which means it was void from the start. It was never created. There is no contract. It's completely undone. Um, fraudulent inducement of contract is often used as a defense to if the other side wants to enforce a contract, which we'll get into and we'll see. You can say, oh, no, you can't force that contract, Your Honor, because it was fraudulently in, in, obtained. Our signature or consent was fraudulently obtained. Um, next slide, please. 
So some of you may be familiar with the Bones arbitration. I participated in the Bones arbitration. The only reason I'm talking about it is because it's a good example of fraud in the entertainment litigation context that I know a lot about um, because I lived it for a number of years. Um, we represented a, one of the producers of the show Bones that aired for 10 years on Fox. And briefly, uh, the plaintiff claimed in that case, the, it was a license fee claim. Uh, we claimed that Fox had an obligation the Fox studio produced the show and licensed it to Fox Broadcasting Company. So inter-party license, we claimed that the license fees were undervalued. They were not market value. The contracts required them to be, I'll just use a shorthand of market value. And it's a standard sort of proper participation case that we do all the time. Um, the interesting thing here and the way the fraud comes into this case is that one of Fox defenses was, well, sorry, guys, you signed a release. We gave you a release that says the license fees for seasons five and six are going to be X. And sign this release or we're canceling the show. That's very important. They said, well, you sign or else. They basically put a figurative gun to their head and said, sign this release or we're canceling the show. And their defense was, sorry, Your Honor, they signed a release of Kane's license fees. What are, what are they here complaining about? And so you see that uh, that case law quote, which they quoted to us that, you know, written release extinguishes any obligations covered by the releases terms. That's why you have releases, provided that the release has not been obtained by fraud. So we argued and the arbitrator found that the releases had been obtained by fraud. They were therefore void ab initio. They were of no force and effect, and we were allowed to pursue our fraud claims. Um, can you go on, please, Tracy? So going a little more deeply into this, this release, basically Fox presented the plaintiffs with a release that said the license fees are okay and you're not going to sue us about the license fees. But they also said at the same time they gave us the release that everyone has to sign this. Every participant on the show, the actors, the producers, the showrunner, all have to sign this or we're canceling votes. The problem was, and we got evidence, documentary and testimony evidence about this, that it, this, this promise was false when made. Fox never had any intention of canceling Bones. Fox knew it was false when made, obviously, because they knew that the actors were not going to sign the release. And the actors, in fact, never did sign the release. Only the producers did. Um, the Fox never told the producers that the actors weren't going to sign. They never told the producers that the actors didn't sign. They got the actor's signature, filed it away, and the license fees were what they were. We also discovered during the course of the arbitration that Fox made a new secret overall deal with one of the participants. So basically gave them a lot of additional consideration, compensation for okaying these license fees. Um, so that was those two things, the fact that the actors never signed and Fox knew the actors were never going to sign and the idea of the secret overall deal that they hid from everybody else. Those were kind of the smoking guns that showed that Fox had a present intention to never perform under this contract, under this release. They were never going to cancel the show. They knew not everyone was going to sign off. You can go to the next one, please. So this is a quote, I'm not gonna read all of it. It's a quote from the arbitration award. The arbitrator basically found that the evidence found around in the release supports a finding of fraud with the intent to get participants to sign off and at the same time preclude litigation about the license fees. Um, and then you go to the bottom, accordingly, the release is void ab initio. The arbitrator finds that plaintiffs have established their claims for breach of contract and fraud. So obviously the the addition of fraud, of a claim for fraud in litigation is a, a veritable gold mine because fraud, you know, thinking back to your law school days, uh, contains or carries with it the possibility of punitive damages. And we end up in Bones getting not only commensatory damages for breach of contract, but also punitive damages. It was like the arbitration award was about $180 million for four uh, plaintiffs for a number of years. That arbitration award was appealed. The court cut the punitives. We were fighting about that, and then it ended up settling. Um, and I can't talk about how much it ended up settling for, but our clients were not displeased with the amount, and it was the the it was the the stick of punitive damages that was really the the difference maker. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please, Tracy. Um, 
So now I want to get to, and the, the, I only have five minutes, I'm going to get to questions too, but um, this sounds great, right? Well, there's a lot of problems with, with, with fraud, with litigating fraud claims. So there's a lot of problems. First off, in there's pleading and evidentiary issues. You have to allege fraud in the complaint, the pleading document, with particularity. Uh, that means something very significant in legalese. If you don't allege it with particularity, the who, what, when, where, how, you can get the complaint dismissed at the pleading stage before you even have a chance to develop evidence. Then when you do develop evidence, if you survive that, fraud has to be proven with clear and convincing evidence. Breach of contract is just preponderance of the evidence. It's 50.5% in your favor, you win, breach of contract. Clear and convincing evidence is something more than that. It's also something less than the criminal standard, which is beyond reasonable doubt, which is like 99.9%. But it's somewhere in the middle between 51 and 100% is clear and convincing evidence. It has to be because of punitive damages, it has to be very clear. The finder of fact has to be really convinced that the fraud occurred. The other problem, which is a little technical and legal, but it goes back to what I was talking about at the beginning and what that question was about, is what's called in California, actually nationwide, the economic loss rule. And what that means is basically, in a nutshell, you can't turn a breach of contract into a fraud. Contract law and tort law are separate. Never the twain shall meet. Every not every breach of contract is a fraud. Not every breached contract was fraudulently induced. There has to be something, and these these are the the quotes. There has to be something above and beyond the breach, right? There has to be something. You can't. A person can't recover in tort for a breach that merely restates the contractual obligations. So, if you have a contract and the other side breaches it. That is not a fraud unless there was something above and beyond, unless there was some duty beyond the contract itself that was violated. Going back to the Bones situation, that duty was, was the release, right? The, the, everyone has a right to not be defrauded when they sign a contract, a separate contract, right? This was not the overall contract that gave the clients money. This was a piece of paper saying you're not going to sue us because you agree that these license fees are okay. But that piece of paper, that promise was fraudulently induced. So that was the extra contractual promise that was violated, the actual contractual duty that was violated. It was independent of the contract. Um, I spend, as a litigator, a lot of time uh, talking through this with clients because a lot of clients, when they have a contract with a studio that's going to pay them you know, 10% of adjusted gross or 15% of adjusted gross on a show that it, they're lucky enough to create that creates a lot of revenue and makes everyone a lot of money. They naturally, of course, feel that they've been defrauded when they get when they get a Lon's audit report and it says, oh yeah, you're actually, these license fees are way too low. You're actually owed a hundred million dollars. I mean, of course you'd feel like you were defrauded. Like, oh, they, they never, they, they always knew they were going to screw me and they never had any intention of performing. Well, that's, it's natural to feel that way, but it's very hard to prove that someone made a promise without any intention of performing. And one of the things Alon said earlier, which I think is important to remember, is that, you know, I, I'm no friend of the big studios, right? I litigate against the big studios all the time, but the big studios, they are successful businesses and they have vast accounting departments. And I truly do believe, it's hard for me to say this, but I do, I do believe that they are not trying to screw their talent, right? They're not trying to cheat them out of money. These definitions of back end, as a lot of you know, are unbelievably complex. And there's a, there's a thousand ways to tweak them and to squeeze the, the revenue in the studio's favor. But that isn't a breach of contract isn't a silly of fraud. That's the most important thing I'm trying to get across. It has to be something above and beyond just the breach. Um, that's basically all I have. Uh, thank you for your time. I know it's about, we have about one minute for questions. So I want to get to Alon uh, asking me your questions. Thank you. You know, let me just, uh, really, there's one really key question is, um, was the arbitrator allowed to award punitives? And, and that is that unusual? From what you remember, yes, it is, and and I don't know if it will ever happen again because there most of the contracts with the studios have very all caps bold uh, punitive damages waivers. Okay, right? this one what the it had a punitive damages waiver, but it was the studio 
versus the participants, we allege that the fraud took place and proved the fraud to, took place above at the network and above the studio network, which is all the same company. So we were allowed to uh, get punitives that way. The judge in Superior Court obviously saw it a different way. He saw the, the waiver and said, no, he struck all the punitive damages. We ended up settling for, you know, like I said, a number that was between zero and 200 million. But, you know, we had a fight on our hands about that very issue. Thank you, Chad. And, and I, I know we're running a little bit over time. I just want to take a moment to thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Chad. Thank you, Leslie, uh, from the Beverly's Bar Association for helping us today. And then thank you to the chair of this uh, webinar, Greg Sills. And thank you all for spending an hour with us and hopefully getting some good value. And uh, there's more. If you need to reach out to each of the three of us, uh, our information is within the package uh, that is included for this webinar. Thank you again. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone.